Hi everyone and welcome to uh, our webinar today about government aftershock and building uh, on a collective learning exercise. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, I know this has been a, a long year for many of us um, and we're all waiting and anticipating for the end. Uh, but we did want to share before we finished the year some key insights from government aftershock. Um, firstly, I think it's important just to recognize what, what happened. Uh, you know, from early on in the year when we first realized that we'd need to do something different and we started talking with um, a mixture of people. We ran a co-design process with <clears throat> a group Cofluence who helped us co-design with over 60 stakeholders around the world. And that led to a, a global enterprise with over 65 events, uh, all unified by our core three government aftershock questions of what to leave behind, what to keep, and what to do differently given what we've learned, uh, with involving over 5,500 participants uh, from all around the world. And then we had our high level forum uh, involving a range of speakers, um, including ministers, heads of state, uh, a lot of experienced practitioners um, and some rich discussions all around many different angles uh, of what this crisis has revealed about the workings of government and where it needs to head next. Um, today, we're just going to share some of the, the key sort of emerging, emergent insights as we work through our analysis. Um, there's quite a lot of stuff to, to work through. Um, and also to hear from a couple of event hosts about their experience of uh, government aftershock and what they got out of it. Uh, so we thought it'd be best to, to start with that. Uh, so I'm going to uh, pass in a moment to our two local hosts for their insights. Um, really framing around the question of, you know, what did this allow that you wouldn't have been able to, to talk about or do otherwise? So uh, Bridget, let's start with you. What did okay. Kevin Aftershock do for uh, Center for Public Impact? Thanks, Alex, um, and thank you very much for having me. Um, so as Alex said, I'm uh, Bridget Nuri Jennings, and I'm Global Head of Communications for the Center for Public Impact. Uh, for those of you not familiar with us, we're a not-for-profit foundation uh, founded by the Boston Consulting Group. We work with government leaders, frontline workers, and communities primarily in Australia and New Zealand, the UK, and North America. We have a mission to reimagine government so that it works for everyone. Simple, right? So this time last year, we released some thinking about what our emerging vision for a reimagined government looks like. Um, and we're finding that it's one that embraces complexity, relationship building and experimentation for learning. Uh, we explored that vision through a series of webinars earlier this year with ANZOG, which is what got us plugged into the Government Aftershock Dialogues Network. Um, and so from there, like OPSI and really many of you, I imagine, we were really curious about some of the innovation we were starting to see in government worldwide as a result of the COVID-19 pan pandemic. So when government aftershock, uh, the global event started to take shape, it felt like a really perfect opportunity for us to start to dig deeper in each of our key regions to explore several different dimensions of how government aftershock, um, government is being reimagined really after the shock. So in a minute, I'll, I'll play a brief video, uh, which will provide some framing about how we're seeing the events of the last year and really the events of the last decade, build, building to a creation of what we're seeing as a new era for government. Um, and then after the video, I'll share with you what we heard from our panelists at um, our panelists and the uh, 400 or so participants we had at our virtual workshops, which took place from Melbourne, where we explored thinking and systems in government, London, where we talked about how community leaders are pioneering new methods for listening that government can learn from, and then finally Washington DC, where we talked to government, not for profit profit and private sector leaders. So a bit of a more of a cross sectoral conversation there about what it means to, to build a inclusive economies after the shock. Um, so if Heather, you don't mind just teeing up the video. Over the past decade, the relationship between people and government has become increasingly frayed. 
A series of global shocks have shaken citizens' trust in their government's ability to adapt to meet their changing needs, and the power to drive change continues to rest in the hands of relatively few. In 2020, the COVID-19 crisis has brought into sharp focus the need for government to work differently. Until now, much of the debate around government and public service reform is about what government should do, how services should be structured, how performance should be tracked, or how decisions should be made. However, the damaged relationship between government and citizens is proof that not enough emphasis has been placed to date on how government should be, the beliefs and principles that drive government action. But there is hope. Changemakers at different levels of government and in frontline public services around the world are pioneering a new vision for government based on three core beliefs. First, that most of the challenges we face as a society are complex in nature. Second, that the quality of human relationships matters a great deal. And third, that progress is best achieved through experimentation and a process of continuous learning. These beliefs have given rise to a new set of values and principles that serve as a useful guide for the future of government, particularly as leaders are grappling with how to rebuild a post-COVID society. They call on government leaders to think systematically, but act locally, share power with those best placed to act, challenge unnecessary hierarchy and collaborate across boundaries, seek out strengths and build on them, champion the voices of those who are heard the least, and optimise for learning rather than control. While the disconnect between government and people has been growing for some time, the COVID-19 recovery presents a powerful opportunity for us to close that gap and reimagine government so that it works for everyone. Are you part of the growing movement to reimagine government? Join the conversation. Thanks very much. So that kind of gives you some framing um, that we use at the top of the of, of each of the events uh, to kind of explain explain where where we've been um, and to provide the foster for a conversation um, around I think where where we're headed. Um, so our workshop uh, on thinking and systems from Melbourne um, highlighted that first belief um, core belief that we that we referenced in the video, uh, the need to embrace complexity and think more in systems and government. While our events in London and Washington DC highlighted the importance of that second belief around relationship building uh, by uh, listening to the seldom heard as we talked about uh, with charity leaders in London and then collaborating across silos to build a more inclusive recovery as we did in Washington DC. So the third of those core beliefs, um, interestingly around for the future of government, that around experimentation for learning, um, it won't surprise you to hear was of course present in every in every discussion that we had across the three events. Um, so we found that obviously the pandemic has forced the need for a much more experimental mindset across government this year. Um, and, and for all of us, I think the big question is whether or not governments can continue to embrace that mindset and really this new way of being more broadly as we're defining it um, when the pandemic starts to fade from memory. Um, so I thought it might be helpful to sort of um, surface some high level themes in responses to the three core government aftershock uh, questions um, and the things that we heard, even in the very different um, discussions we had across those three events, there were some really interesting themes um, around what we needed to, to stop, start and carry on doing. Um, that I think were really interesting. So firstly, in terms of what we need to keep doing, uh, believing or being, um, as we kind of started to think about it. There was, interestingly enough, a real consensus that initiatives like this one, like Government Aftershock, really are exactly the kind of thing we needed um, this year, uh, in, in part because I think we're all chained to our computers, um, but also as a way of, of, I think, creating the community that we're all seeking um, in this learning journey. I think there was a lot of outreach um, and cross-sectoral collaboration um, this year and the breakdown of silos both within and across governments um, in a really powerful way. Um, and so I think being able to have a space for reflection and discussion on these topics was really vital. Um, as Sam Ray um, of Conservation Volunteers Australia said during, during our Melbourne event, um, this year we've seen a much more join, more joined up thinking and more collective uh, learning on the whole. Um, there's been a real acceleration there. And then secondly, in frontline services, um, the short, shortened feedback loops are another thing uh, that we definitely want to keep doing um, after the shock. Uh, so the shortened feedback loops with central government have become 
a welcome side effect um, for many um, that work uh, directly in relationship with government. So Jennifer McAteer of homelessness charity Groundswell told our London event how helpful it's been to, to be able to feed back the needs of the the community she serves, the homeless community, to NHS England in real time. So a lot of the bureaucracy you often see um, just kind of disappeared. And there was a really interesting report uh, that actually came out from NHSC last week, maybe for those of you who hadn't seen it, around busting bureaucracy, which took a look at some of those tech technical and um, technological adaptations, um, but also some of that mind sh mindset shift um, that we've been starting to see as well. And then as for what uh, we need to leave behind, um, no surprise here uh, when you talk about government, but short-term thinking, and obviously this is a challenge for us um, when you think about political cycles, um, but Jeremiah, Jeremiah Gracia, uh, the Director of Economic Development for the City of Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, shared with our Washington DC event um, that this really provided um, in his mind an opportunity for us to kind of think bigger picture um, and maybe break that need um, that we often think in terms of political cycles for short-term solutions. Um, but this kind of this and, and he was arguing, I think, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement in particular this year um, has started to create space for more of the conversations around more long term discussions and, and systems thinking. So secondly, another thing that we would want to leave behind, um, I would say overall our participants um, put the failures of public sector agencies down to several key themes, um, including no surprise rigid ways of working, um, the idea that government even has all of the answers. I think we've seen a lot um, this year of, of the government being a bit more comfortable to saying, I don't know the answer here and, and we're um, experimenting ourselves. Um, and then the practices, processes and institutions that we know are not conducive to systems thinking that very siloed. Um, uh, linear thinking. To move forward, Misha Kaur of the Australian Taxation Office, um, I thought put it really well um, in explaining what we really need is, is what she calls a process of unlearning, uh, the need to let go of the assumptions and mental models that we've had kind of historically. So that's kind of what we've been thinking about with this um, shift uh, in how government needs to be. So finally, um, in terms of what, what we heard about what government needs to start doing. First, um, you won't be surprised to hear you know, us say building relationships, but I think in, in unexpected ways, I think um, there's been a lot of um, cross-sectoral, um, cross-silo um, interactions and relationship building this year that I think is really a um, great uh, starting point. Um, so Jerome Harvey, a guy of, our, of a UK-based charity, um, the Tope Project uh, that works in the social care space, um, really made a powerful argument around this being uh, about the art of listening. Um, he explained to our UK workshop that government leaders um, can also be vulnerable, that the important part of, of um, building a trusting relationship between government and citizens, um, as he was arguing, um, is it is vulnerability is an important aspect of, of building uh, that relationship and, and, and ultimately advancing change. So that was an interesting discussion from our UK um, crowd about that. And then secondly, um, putting the focus on uh, an inclusive recovery. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around that this year. And I think um, Arturo Franco of the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Development was explaining that um, if anything, we could see a silver lining of this year. Um, both with COVID and, and I would argue as well, Black Lives Matter, particularly in the US, um, that this is a real opportunity for us to reimagine um, who the economy uh, is built for ultimately and how it's structured. Um, so that was just a really high level overview. Um, and we found, I mean, we at CPI found those conversations to be incredibly candid and enlightening uh, to those of you who may have joined. Um, and we're actually in the process of drafting our theory of change um, based on these insights uh, and others that we've been gathering uh, in the year since we released our vision for government. So if anyone has any insights or guidance on the delicate art of drafting a theory of change, please do let me know. Um, and then just quickly before I hand back, I'd just really like to thank Heather and Alex at OPSI for all their leadership and hard work um, and for creating these, the space for these conversations to take place because I think it's been really powerful uh, for our team. Um, and this is just a small sample, but we really do look forward to the conversation today. So I'll head back to you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget. Sure. Um, now I'm going to turn to another uh, eager uh, supporter of, of government aftershock. Um, it was great to have CPI as one of the, the early, uh, uh, early groups to jump in and help build the momentum for this. 
uh, but another another one, uh, Jose Mendoza, Mendoza, who works with uh, Caroline Paulick Teal, who's uh, been another uh, eager uh, enthusiast around this work. Um, Jose, would you like to share something around uh, what you got out of uh, your event and, and government aftershock overall? Yes, of course. Um... Well, th thanks, uh, Alex and Heather, for uh, I mean the organization of this webinar and also <clears throat> for all the support in general uh, with the with the local hub of the government aftershock for Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and Denmark. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so basically, it was a it, it was a really um, I would say challenging. Um, yeah, it was a, a challenging task to uh, try to uh, put in all these, um, not only actors, but also all these ideas about like what to do uh, or about like COVID, but also to think what comes next. So um, after basically two days uh, discussing about that and hearing people from government, people from institutions like the OCD, um, uh, think tanks and also um, uh, public servants and citizens, we, we uh, have some ideas uh, which, um, well, Bridget actually uh, mentioned a lot of them. And I think we, we, <laughs> we, um, we have a lot of uh, coincidences there. And uh, so I would like to show some of, try to, to show some of, of them. Uh, which were our main takeaways. Uh, first of all, uh, there are two scenarios for us, or yeah, let's, let's put it in that way. Uh, COVID-19 as a major force uh, uh, for collaboration in public sector, uh, that means that we need, I mean, we the people, but also uh, public servants need uh, engaging, engaging institutions. And that goes straight into the into the aspect of more coordination, more collaboration, more um, let's say this uh, silo inter, in, interplay, um, because we we've seen that at national level institutions where uh, I mean they have different uh, speeds of reaction and also like different levels of um, of success. Most of them, it's it's hard to say this, but most of them have really struggled. Um, to cope with the uh, with uh, uh, yeah with solutions even at local level, and and that's where we actually uh, think that uh, institutions at national level should actually engage more with, for example, uh, institutions at local level, local governments, um, local think tanks, research centers, universities, etc., in order to prepare themselves for the next for what's coming next. The second thing, um, it's about institutional diversity. Um, COVID-19 showed that um, regular solutions or solutions for, let's say, um, some part of the people, the, the way that we usually think of, uh, they are not longer valid or they, they didn't uh, create as much as impact uh, in, in these terms. And we see, uh, we see for example, uh, at least with the innovation recorder, which is uh, the, the tool that we that we used uh, to to try to explain this, is like all these differences within public servants, for example, those we have digital skills, those we had, um, uh, yeah, different interests, uh, those we, uh, with uh, those uh, that actually took a like very long to cope with the changes that COVID-19 was uh, creating at the institutional level. So, um, and therefore like the, 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 this, uh, this diversity was also not reflected in terms of how governments act towards the people. Uh, we see that women, uh, we see uh, uh, vulnerable groups like migrants, they were like, particularly hit by the, by, the, by the pandemic and we are just reacting to them. And the third thing uh, will be uh, creating these anticipatory capacities and policies. Um, nothing of what we have said is new. We, we, we can uh, track these trends of uh, government change, of digitaliz dig uh, digitalization, of um, um, government agility, 
uh, to like 10, 15 years. I mean, the OPSI has done a lot of work on, on that. And, uh, but somehow, uh, basically, uh, the pandemic hit governments, hit the people in a, in a way that we couldn't measure, we couldn't foresee. And, and that's, of course, something to worry. Uh, in that sense, we need uh, new measures, actually, and, and skills for evaluating those, those activities and the speed and consequences uh, of our, our or like government decisions in real time. Um, and the second scenario for, for us is that um, COVID-19 uh, is also a major force to, uh, to change and turn around the old structures. Again, we go back to this idea that a year ago, governments didn't even think of that. Uh, they were doing things as, as usual. They were taking their time to um, digitalize, to start thinking of uh, maybe in the next couple of years, but that's, that's no longer valid. In that sense, uh, uh, what we learned from the government's aftershock session is that we need high frequency data. Uh, we have seen misinformation. We have seen a lot of uh, things going around with the vaccine or like with possible um, COVID uh, impacts on health, et cetera, et cetera. And governments being unable to actually uh, not only prevent, but also respond effectively towards uh, the population. Uh, in that sense, we need this idea of disaggregated data, diversity in data, like fluidness. Um, and for that, you, you, uh, governments need skills. Um, on the other hand, uh, we have seen that institutions that, I mean, public sector themselves, they, they, call, uh, they, are, they call themselves like uh, delivery institutions, right? Like they deliver service. They deliver service, sorry. Uh, but right now, uh, because of the pandemic, we believe, or at least like in these sessions, we conceptualize the idea of managers of well being. It's not only about delivering, but it is actually delivering smart, creating like all the, uh, let's say, the, the, the environment in which actually people can, can feel safe, can feel, uh, can trust in governments, and they can develop in a, in a, in a proper way. In that sense, new definitions of well-being uh, need to be uh, in place. And finally, well, the, the, the aspect of agile bureaucracy. Um, at least from the experience of the innovation recorder, we found that, again, um, basically a lot of governments or institutions were digitalized, uh, meaning that services were put up front on the internet, but actually bureaucracies were exactly the same in the back end. So that, that meant uh, public servants doing exactly the same, but from home and trying to figure it out how to do it through the internet. And that's actually not digitalization. <laughs> um, so what comes next after the government aftershock? We have thought or tried to conceptualize five, uh, five things. I mean, definitely the debate about um, what's the mission of government? What's the mission of, uh, of all the institutions like a center on well-being? Uh, that's that's an, a, a new thing that we, uh, that governments need to rethink. Uh, then we give close, closer attention soon in at the local level. We have seen so many good examples of how the pandemic was managed at local level and how they integrated where national governments, when they had to go there and try to, to, to scale them up, scale those solutions. Um, then advocating definitely um, for individual and organizational learning. We have seen as well that it's not only about sending public servants home and say like, from now on you're gonna work uh, using your computer. It's about skills, it's about competences, it's about, um, yeah, it, it, it's all about that. And determine what is, it is measured. Um, since the focus should be well-being, then we need as well new measures of well-being. So that's also, that has to be on the debate. And uh, well, basically jumping at the top of the wave. Um, this doesn't end with COVID. Uh, Last week, I think it was the IMF that said that uh, there will be a, a huge uh, economic crisis in 2021 that will last um, a couple of years. 
if there is a climate emergency, climate crisis. So there are more pandemics coming and uh, we need anticipation basically. So uh, we believe that uh, sessions as the government aftershock are great uh, spaces to actually discuss about that, to put these topics in place and try to somewhat um, create these environments where national policies can come together with local policies and as well with civil society uh, effort. So uh, yeah, thanks again, Alex and Heather for, for, uh, for these efforts. And uh, yeah, basically that's what we have to say. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you to both of you. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of rich insight that's been coming out of these events. And our job is to try and pull together all of this. Um, I'm just going to I'm going to pass to Heather in a second, but just in terms of the process that we undertook with government aftershock, was we asked each of the event hosts to give us a quick synopsis on the day of what are the the key thing, some of the key takeaways um, that we've been working through, and we've also asked uh, or encouraged event hosts to provide us with richer, deeper reflections once they've had a bit of time to digest. Um, as uh, CPI have done, uh, and uh, as Jose and Caroline have done in a blog, and we'll be collecting all of that to make it more accessible for everyone to see. Um, and I think just even out of those two events, you can already see, uh, despite different contexts um, all around the world, there were common themes and common issues. This has been a, a big shock for everyone, and everyone's experience has been different but there are commonalities due to the, the, the common nature of our institutions and structures that mean um, we hope as the OECD, we can convene and pull together and aggregate some of these and make sense for the wider world. So Heather, would you like to uh, share and go through some of the preliminary takeaways that we got? For sure, thanks Alex. And thank you, Bridget and Jose for your insights. Um, I'm going to ask my colleague Kent to launch a poll right now for all of you to answer just to get an insight on how many of you actually attended Government Aftershock and whether you attended the first day, the second day, whether you're involved as a host, um, and that'll help us sort of frame this conversation to be applicable to you. So just to start things off, uh, I want to open this up with a quote from, Angel, or from the Secretary General of the OECD, uh, who opened up the day two of Government Aftershock, and he said, Going back to normal is the last thing we want because the normal that we had before was not good enough. And I think we've heard this message throughout the, the presentations we just heard. And also if you participate in the, in the day of events or the days of events, this came up again and again. So what does that really mean? And how do we make sure that we don't go back to this old normal that's really not ready for the complex futures that we face? So I'm gonna break this into a few different key insights and themes that we heard. And the first is in working methods of government. So we've seen that government is really capable of innovating. It's capable of being agile. It's capable of adapting and moving quickly, of working remotely, of collaborating across silos in ways that we've never really seen before. And this crisis has really demonstrated the capabilities and the strengths of government. Um, but the question that we really need to ask ourselves is how is this gonna be sustained moving forward? And how do we make sure that this doesn't end up being just an individual responsibility to innovate and to be agile and to adapt, but also it's reflected in the entire system, in the leadership uh, and in the way that government really works and is built. Um, so as we move forward, we need to be thinking about how do we make leaders and, and across the whole of government, how do we support this strong, this flexible, this agile way of thinking and the way of working? Uh, and how do we make this sustainable over the long run and not just an exhausting effort for many, many public servants who have worked tirelessly over this year. Um, we need to sustain this moving forward. The second thing that we've really seen over the last year has been rapid digital transformation uh, and more increased use of data. Um, so we've seen that government and society have digitized overnight out of necessity and things that otherwise would have taken probably years to implement were implemented in a matter of days because there was no choice. Um, and this was something that happened in government. It's something that happened in private sector. We've seen even our grandparents learn how to use technology because now it's a necessity. Um, but with that comes a lot of responsibilities for government. And I think we've caught ourselves a little bit uh, behind in terms of 
the regulations and the way of doing things online and the way of, of monitoring the use of data. So I'm gonna point out a, a quote that came up on the first day of the event. Human-centric regulations must go hand in hand with digitization approaches from the government. Data privacy, transparency, and digital rights must be at the core of every strategy. So as we move into a much more digital-centered world, we need to remember that digitization and digital approaches, these are, these are tools and they are methods, but they are not there to replace the human elements. At the end of the day, people need to be at the center and we need to make sure that our regulations and way of doing things is equipped to protect people's rights and, and keep it a, a human-centered process. This also means that inclusion is incredibly important, that we need to make sure that we're not leaving people behind. And the last thing I'll, I'll say on this topic is that when we digitize approaches and methods and service delivery and whatnot, it's quite easy for us to just keep the same thing and put it online. But we don't want to just transpose the physical world to the digital world. We need to have a critical reflection about whether these approaches and these methods and these ways of doing service delivery are really what we want, uh, rather than just kind of using a redundant tool or process and putting it online because that's what we need to do, or that's, that's the easiest thing to do. So as we move into this digital world, really we need to start putting these questions in our mind every time we do these things. Are there the building blocks in place to make sure that this is inclusive and human centered? And then on the proactive side, are we thinking about the future technology that's coming out? Are we thinking about preempting those, of, of steering that uh, transformation? So these are just building blocks and, and piece, bits and pieces that came up in the first day of discussions in particular, but also on the second day in our discussions on data governance. The third thing that's really stood out is collaboration. And this collaboration has happened across uh, levels of government, it's happened across country borders, and it, it has happened across uh, sectors of society. We've seen uh, actors from the individual to the private sector, to the nonprofit, to the governmental level, all collaborating because there have been common problems. And it's a lot easier to collaborate when you have a common problem to solve. So the question now will be, how do we make sure that in the absence of what are really, really apparent common problems that this collaboration continues? How do we build on the strengths of local government in that local governments have networks? They are much more directly connected to, to citizens in serving their needs and, and uh, working with organizations in their area to, to help people in their communities. So how are we listening to what local governments are saying? How are we making sure that funding mechanisms support the work of local governments and allow them to be part of the whole governance process? And then in terms of uh, private sector and nonprofit sector collaboration, we've seen the use of hackathons repeatedly in this time of crisis. We've seen challenge-based procurement. We've seen a lot more flexibility in those areas. But how are we making sure that this continues again beyond a crisis scenario? We need to adapt, sort of catch up with our structures and processes to make sure this continues. And finally, in the face of crisis, and this relates to the poll on the right-hand side of your screen, um, has the crisis made it more or less important for national governments to work with each other? So we polled this, this poll on the second day of the government aftershock event, and 72% of respondents said, yes, uh, it's more important now that national governments work with each other. And I think that the, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted that our modern complex challenges are not limited to country borders. They really span across the entire world. And although they have different regional implications, we need to really work on our collaboration approaches. We need to think about the role of international organizations and we need to start really thinking about how we collectively as a globe <laughs> problem solve these issues especially not only in the face of, of crises that we might face in the future or even ones that we're facing today like climate change, but also as we see more interconnectivity in terms of trade and digitization, we need to make sure that these relationships are built um, to, to sustain those and to deal with these cross-border challenges. And then to a pillar that came up in pretty well every local event uh, and every session on the second day is trust and transparency. And I want to open this with a quote from Secretary of State Maria Fonseca of Portugal, who said, 
Trust is what makes the difference between the success and the unsuccess of our measures in this time of, time of pandemic crisis. Trust begins with communication, communication and participation. We've seen over the last uh, six to nine, I guess now it's almost a year, uh, that governments have changed their strategies to communication, that they've made it much more human centered and that they've deliberately uh, targeted communities that might not normally be reached. Uh, we've seen innovative communication techniques like using Easter Bunny costumes and having kind of a, a child focused communication. We've seen in Norway, for instance, where they engage deliberately with migrant communities that are often overlooked to make sure that the messages we're getting across. And this is really important moving forward that we see this human side of communication and that we try to make it more inclusive to all of society. The second uh, point is on just participatory processes that we really need to make sure that everybody is involved in the decision making process, um, because this really brings people on board and having transparency and openness in these decision making processes also will improve people's attitudes towards them and their compliance to these measures. And one of the things we've seen in the crisis is that governments have been much more open to the fact that they don't have all the answers that there's a lot of uncertainty and they're trying to make decisions that are the best decisions for the population based on the knowledge that they have at hand. And I think that that openness and transparency towards society led to a lot of increases in trust during this time. I'll end this off with a, with a comment that was made by Minister Astrup of Norway, uh, and that was that trust is built over time. So yes, in this case, in a lot of contexts, we've seen trust increase and, and seen this importance of trust be foremount, but we need to make sure that this is sustained and that it's reflected in, in the way that government does things and the way that government structured and the way it use particip uses participatory processes. Uh, and then moving on to policy priorities and inclusion. So we've seen throughout this year, um, some major gaps actually in policy priorities. And, and we've recognized that sometimes there's a difference between what people want and what government is doing. And one of these things that I found, at least personally, is seeing the gaps in welfare policies, that a lot of the emergency benefits to people were way more extensive than traditional welfare policies, which meant that people that were living on, on welfare previously were not receiving the nece necessary means to survive and to, to function and to, to be an active member of society. So this is created some opportunities to explore more programs like universal, universal basic income. Another that thing that we've seen throughout this year is issues of gender-based violence and systemic racism coming again to the forefront. And it's not that these issues haven't been around for decades, but this year they've become very prominent in the political debate. So how are we making sure that the conversations from this year are not just about the pandemic, but they're also about this, these multifaceted and very interconnected problems within society? How are we addressing these? How are we improving citizens' well-being and the way that societies interact and, and communities interact with each other. This is really a clear and an important place for us to invest in more inclusive and sustainable economies, infrastructure, and societies. And at the end of the day, I think one of the key takeaways from this crisis is that people are at the center and that we need to focus policy and government's way of operating on the human element, that social connection is important, that community building is important, and that caring societies uh, matter. So I'm just gonna close this again with a, a quote from Nadine from the Center for Public Impact. Uh, Listen, learn and adapt. I've learned that people are not hard to reach. They are seldom heard. They can be your biggest cheerleaders, work with them. They are your recovery and your rebuild. And I think that's really important as we frame this recovery to think about people at the center of it. And the last thing I'll end with here is how we approach futures and uncertainty. And this goes back a little bit to what I talked about with working methods of government, but we've seen this year that the complex futures that face us are really challenging and that we do not know what it's gonna look like and it's quite easy to be caught off guard. So it's time that we really probe into the future and that we, we try out different approaches to make sure that we are steering towards, prepare, to, to, towards preferred futures. Um, and Aaron Maniam from Singapore said in, in the second day that 
Just because we are afraid of something doesn't mean we shouldn't deal with it. If we don't, we have a danger of it becoming really explosive. So we have this chance now to really take a deliberate approach to exploring uncertainty and exploring the future. And this means using new methods that are not super familiar to government and investing in these approaches that don't necessarily focus purely on risk aversion, but that look more into the complexity of how government operates. And I'll highlight now just a poll on the right-hand side of your screen, which, says, uh, which was asked to participants on the second day of government aftershock. It's, which innovation methods would you like to see getting more traction beyond COVID-19? And the top method that came up was anticipation and futures thinking, followed closely by systems approaches and then uh, agile and adaptive working methods. So we're seeing here that there is an appetite for new approaches and that governments are really starting to recognize that it's time that we implement these approaches before it's too late and before we're really, really confronted by the next uh, challenge that awaits us. And I'll hand it out now over to Alex to reflect on some of the podcast interviews that we conducted uh, at the start or before this event. Uh, so uh, Kent's just shared the, the poll results there. So you can see um, quite a lot of you were involved in some way, uh, which is fantastic. Um, now, I, I just I wanted to note that, uh, you know, the, the event itself was important and big. But in the lead up to government aftershock, we also had a range of other uh, intelligence gathering exercises and insight harvesting. Um, I won't go through all of those now, but I just wanted to point to that and, and to note that we are drawing on these other elements um, to feed into our, our fuller analysis. Uh, so I'm just noting that we did uh, 30 odd interviews with a range of leaders, uh, practitioners, and, and people within the public sector and outside the public sector that work with the public sector. And I, uh, uh, we've uh, published a, a blog on this uh, on the site, but I, I just wanted to tease out two sentiments from that that I thought were quite important. Uh, one that, as Dom Campbell here says, that you know it's astonishing the mindset, the capability, the leadership that really. Um, many people have undertaken over the last six months whilst responding to something that none of us have ever responded to before. So I think that's a common sentiment that's come through a lot of what we've heard today um, and in the events is that you know government uh, can really do amazing things um, when it allows people to do that whether they're inside the public service or outside. Doesn't mean that everything government did uh, was fantastic this year. There's been plenty that we've seen uh, did not, was not up to scratch, um, whether it be local, state, federal, national, or international. Um, uh, I don't think the multilateral organizations, including OECD, uh, did everything perfectly by any means. And I, but I wanted to point out this other quote um, from the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Secretariat, that I think it's confirmed certain things in terms of what it's really made me understand. We have no time. This existential threat is real, it's now. The fact that we're dealing with this pandemic, but it may not be the last pandemic, and these shocks are going to come. It's made me really ask the question, if we're not going to make the changes we need, we need now, when we are facing this multiplicity of difficulties, then when, and if not us, then who? I think it has really emphasized the generational challenge that we face. This is a pivot point, a real pivot point. Um, and I think that's what we've been trying to get at uh, with this work is to highlight, you know, why, why will this time be different? But before we dive into uh, the questions around what we're doing with all of this and the, the call to action, I uh, would like to open it up to the floor a little in terms of are there any themes or ideas from those of you who have participated that think we, we missed? Um, and uh, we've just put up a little poll here. If you go to wooclap.com uh, slash reflect, um, you don't need to uh, log in or anything. Um, and Kent can put that in the chat. It is there in the chat. Perfect. Um, we'd love you to submit your 
thoughts there. And while that's happening, um, we'll also uh, open the floor to um, any questions about for either us or the our um, event hosts, uh, Bridget and Jose, um, about the process or, or, or things. Uh, so anything about what we heard or what the experience was like or anything about government aftershock itself. And after these questions, we will then return to, well, what are we going to do about all of this? Um, can that, and what should it lead to? Um, sorry, just a second. Uh, oh, there's a question of what is your purpose in doing this work? I.e., how do you foresee OECD working with governments to bring about these changes? So one of the things that we saw at the beginning of this year uh, was that uh, when we created our innovative insights tracker, uh, innovative COVID responses tracker, um, that there were innovative responses happening all around the world. Every government was being forced to innovate. Um, on a scale that we've never really seen before in our lifetimes. Um, and that pointed to us that there was going to be, there was all of this learning happening around the world at the same time. So our aim from the outset was how can we tap into that learning and how can we expose it and share it and connect different groups um, and see what are the insights and lessons that can be translated from different contexts to one another. Um, that was our, our prime aim. As we've done this work um, and government aftershock evolved, um, I can't say that we had a, a crystal clear vision from the very beginning as to what this would be. Um, it was very iterative and emergent, was that we saw that uh, the OECD can help um, as a, a convener and an aggregator. We can pull together these different insights from all of these different audiences and help uh, make them more available to a bigger audience. Um, we're not trying to control or own this conversation by any means, but there's a certain critical mass and momentum that can be gained by pulling and pooling together a bigger audience. Um, so we hope that by connecting the many, many different events, uh, we've created a bit of a, a data set and a resource that can help others use this to, to prompt their own discussions internally within their own organizations or with their partners to say, well, this has been uh, you know, a very strange year. What, it's taught us a lot of things. What are we gonna do about that? Um, and, and to say that we've heard common things all around the world. We know this is important time to change. It's a window of opportunity. Um, so how can we make the most of that? Ah, uh, a new WooClip clap link has been added. Um, sorry for the confusion. Uh, so that was our primary aim, uh, was really to help bring together and uh, increase the collective learning around all of these things. Um, another question, it's great to participate in these online events. Only a very limited number of people were able to come to your Paris conferences. How are you planning to continue and develop these? That's a little bit of an open question. Um, we think we've learned a lot through this and there's been a lot of engagement and support from the broader community. Uh, we would like to continue this um, and we've been talking with event hosts about what worked well, uh, what could be improved um, and we think there's a momentum to, to go on with that um, but that's probably a discussion we'll open up to in the new year about the exact form that will take and obviously we'll need to, to rebrand uh, Government Aftershock to be something more uh, ongoing rather than in relation to a crisis. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to digest. Um, as OECD, are you open to collaborating as a public private part, private sector partnerships with government to support governments in this rapid change and to maintain the development? 
Um, our role at the OECD is to, to provide advice to member countries um, and sometimes to accompany them along their, their change journeys. Um, we're still working out what the best role is for multilateral organizations in this space. We know um, that you know, we saw and heard through these conversations that collaboration is needed at that international level, not just at the national level and within governments. Um, but uh, it was one of the topics was around um, on the high level forum was around the, the sorts of new collaboration architecture and infrastructure that might be needed to help governments work on these things um, where you don't have very formal understood precise processes and settings where things are much more emergent and fluid um, and there's a need to be more agile. What does that look like when governments are working together internationally? Well, we saw some examples of that this year, but I think there's a lot more to be done to collect those lessons and to start thinking about what are the longer term pieces of that inf inf um, collaboration infrastructure that allows that sort of thing to happen on a more ongoing basis. Um, and there's another question, what tools and resources can we use to engage the public in actually identifying and prioritizing indicators of performance? Uh, that's a big question. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that full justice. Um, but I think that's another part of these conversations is, and we've been talking with our, our open government colleagues around how we bring people along on these things. How do, what are some of the better deliberative processes and what are uh, tools like government aftershock as a platform for collective sense making and learning? Um, what might that that work. Uh, so, um, Heather, do you want to take us to the responses to the WooClap? Sorry, one moment. <laughs> So we've seen a few responses come in and one of them that I'll pick out is the citizen leadership point. Uh, so this is definitely something that we've uh, we've seen come up repeatedly on how do we build better participatory processes. Um, and this is something in particular that our colleagues in the open government team of the OECD are working on more deliberately and and I'm hoping we'll be working on in the future as we've seen this is becoming more and more important uh, moving forward. Um, Another one is on the question of results. So how are we going to share the results? Um, we are putting together a brief report of insights that we have here. Uh, and this segues well into our next section, which is on uh, framing a call to action. And how do we really translate the insights that we've gathered from this initiative into a more concrete, actionable way forward for government? So uh, I'll pass it back to Alex, who's kind of leading the way on the call to action to, to share some of his thinking behind that and then to get some of the insights from you and any questions that you have on that process. Um, just before we do, sorry, Matt's asked a really good question in the comments in the chat, um, so which I'm gonna put to Bridget and Jose around, um, of everything you heard and learned from, oops, uh, from participants during government aftershock, what was most challenging to your own preconceptions and beliefs. Uh, Jose, do you want to have a go at that? Yes. Um, so I would say, um, I would say I, I, I was, I, I was really, um, um, how can I put this? Um, I think I, I demythified a little bit um, like the, the role um, of public servants as uh, superheroes that they can handle everything. You know, uh, uh, in public sector, uh, when you're at the top, basically uh, all the needs orders come very top down and there is very little caring about uh, 
what those who actually enable these policies uh, think of them or how they actually feel. Uh, we are talking about empathy. We are talking about um, uh, whether they feel good or not in the workplace with a decision-making process, et cetera, et cetera. So um, to me, I think that was, that was one of the main takeaways. Uh, and, and that's also related to the way uh, institutions collaborate uh, within, I mean, units within a, a government institution, but also is like governmental institutions among themselves. Um, because yes, I mean, uh, we are talking about like large groups of uh, demotivated or apathy or uh, uh, people. So, um, and I think that's, that's important to recognize at least from, from my point of view. Thank you. Um, good points. And Bridget, anything that um, challenged your assumptions? Yeah, I would echo, I mean, everything that Jose's just said, actually, I think the, the um, I think, and it's not that it challenged our assumptions, really, but just it helped us really to reveal um, the humanity, we talk about like the, the humanity and the relationships like between government as this monolith and citizens as the people. But I think we often lose sight of the fact that there are people, individuals that work within and across government too. So that's certainly something we've been exploring, but it was just really um, helpful for us to, to tease that out a bit further. Um, but I think something that maybe has um, is increasingly challenging um, our, our thinking on this. And this was touched on, I think, in one of the comments as well which is um, really trying to understand what the appetite is um, for central government in adopting some of these um, new practices. I think that is a very open uh, conversation. I think we've experienced and certainly at our events um, and a lot of what, what's been shared today is that you know, there's a lot of emerging practices um, of information sharing and digitalization at the local, local government level where things have been able to be um, adapted quite quickly. Um, but I think uh, this shift in a, in a mindset and a way of being at the central government level, I think it's gonna take some time for those practices to tr trickle up. And I think um, that appetite is a, is a real active question for us at the moment. So I think um, t in full disclosure, most of the people that engaged in our discussions came from local government, um, perspectives or charity or community perspectives. Um, and so I think finding a way to, to uh, engage civil service and uh, central government um, in these conversations, I think is, is a particular challenge for us at the moment. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the call to action. Uh, so what we're trying to do, um, wait one second. Uh, what we're trying to do with the call to action is take from all of these diverse insights um, and diverse sources of information and try and make sense of it. Um, this was a, a poll that we'd asked uh, during day two. Um, after a day of exploring government aftershock, would you conclude that government is eager to go back to the old normal and status quo, willing and ready to learn from the crisis, um, or willing to reflect on lessons learned, but less willing to take action? And as you can see, uh, there's an, there was a concentration on the perhaps less action side of things. Uh, so what we really have to ask ourselves is what will make this crisis different to previous ones? Um, not to say that government hasn't changed itself in, in response to previous crises, but if we, for instance, took the global financial crisis, I think it would be a fair question to say, did things really change as much as they might have needed to in light of what was learned then? How are we going to make sure that this time our governments really heed the lessons and embed those into their working? Um, we might think that because the crisis has been more extended and uh, much more immersive, I guess, uh, that this will have deeper effects, but we can't just assume uh, that this will lead to ongoing change. Um, what is going to ensure that the gravitational pull of our previous default settings doesn't just pull us back into a state of affairs that we know was not satisfactory? Um, how can we connect, empower and legitimise efforts within government and outside to demand better of government knowing what we know now? Uh, so what we'll be doing is working with a small group 
um, to try and pull together from these various sources of analysis to really outline a provocation for governments and for all of us and to think about, well, how can we use that to connect people and to, to challenge all of us to state, well, what are we all going to do differently in light of this? Um, because it, as we've just seen, it's not up to just governments, some you know, government to do everything. Uh, all of us have to be an active participant in this process for change to really be sustained. Um, so that's our ambition. Um, it's going to be also, uh, yeah, I think, a bit of an emergent and iterative process, but we're hoping to do it relatively quickly. Um, and to pull uh, and draw on uh, some of the, the other work in the rest of the OECD, which has considered some very specific things in, in deep, great detail. Um, what the, the government aftershock has been trying to do is take that bigger picture of, well, what does this all mean for government as a whole? and how it relates and engages with others. Um, on the next slide, um, we've got you an, another woo clap, uh, which we'd like to ask you, well, what is the most important thing that you want to see come out of this call to action? Um, obviously, this isn't going to be a uh, a magic bullet. It's not going to uh, be something that we put out there and governments will automatically therefore do. Um, it's an attempt to ensure that we really hammer home the insights and the lessons out of all of these conversations and make them available to a much bigger audience and make them actionable um, and point to what are the things that it aligns where governments are already intending to do things. Um, or they could change what they're doing, and so on. Um, so while you add things there, uh, sorry, I'll just respond to one of the other questions. Is the OECD planning on issuing some guidance on business continuity management for public institutions, considering the COVID crisis? Uh, yes, I would expect that's being done by our risk group. Um, I'm afraid not across all of the, the specifics, but yes, uh, that, that is uh, an area that's been talked about. A um, uh, comment there about as we enter a unique window of opportunity to shape the recovery, um, this initiative can provide insights to help reform, inform all of those determining the future state. And that's exactly this. Uh, what we're hoping to do is use this to inform whatever comes next. So some of the things uh, raised, actionable guidance for how government can increase experimentation and a values led approach. Um, futures thinking, uh, best practices, call that is truly actionable for governments, inspiration can use to promote what is possible. Uh, I think all of those things are things that we are keen to see. Um, Multidisciplinary approach to improvement. Uh, yes. Um, I think all of those things align strongly with what we're, we're hoping to articulate and what's come through in the different insights from the different channels of government aftershock. Um, so we might just go back to the slides. Um, the other thing I just wanted to, to note is that, you know, this has been a, a collective learning prototype. Um, we started this out as an exercise in doing a, a different type of event, uh, but it evolved over the year into a, demonstrating a different way of collective learning and sense making of how we can, uh, as a collective, really think about what does all of this mean? What is it revealed? And what are we going to do about it? Um, as I mentioned, we're keen to explore what a continuation of this might be, building on the lessons. Um, we, as part of this process, we had a, an event guide, uh, which was fairly detailed. Um, and we're hoping to build on that and improve it. Um, and that others can use that as a resource and we can again collectively build on our knowledge about what makes for these sorts of good events how do we do these sorts of widespread engagements 
um, in different ways, how do we use them to really um, not only ensure that there are rich, insightful conversations, but also that we get out of it rich, powerful insights that can drive action. Um, and of course, this has been a collective exercise, so none of this could have been done without everyone involved, um, including uh, many, many event hosts, but also with the support of uh, the European uh, Union uh, through the Horizon 2020 program and the, um, the support of um, Microsoft uh, for the high level forum. Um, one uh, last slide. Uh, they've, there are a range of uh, links and resources that I just mentioned. So we will be doing an ongoing discussion of these things uh, through the blogs where you'll be able to see the different pieces of analysis that will feed into the call to action. Um, there's that event guide that I mentioned. We have a playlist uh, which includes a number of the uh, YouTube recordings of the local events uh, from the 17th that you know, might be of interest. And if you want to listen to any of the podcast interviews that we did, uh, there's that too. Um, in terms of uh, just some final comments from the crowd. Um, uh, can we put key learnings from earlier on Twitter? So can we retweet it? Uh, yes, I think we should be able to do that. Um, and yes, we will be sharing uh, the recording of this webinar on YouTube for your viewing pleasure. Um, otherwise, uh, this will be an ongoing process and we'd love to hear from you. Um, you can always email us at opsi at oecz.org if you've got any questions or comments. Um, otherwise, we hope you'll continue to be engaged and interested as we develop this. Um, and there will be opportunities to provide us with feedback um, as this becomes uh, more solidified. Um, and of course, you can always comment on any of the individual blogs and pieces where we are talking about these, uh, the analysis of this work. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone who's been involved um, and collaborated. Uh, as I said, this is the only way you can do a collective endeavor is if the collective's involved. So, Thank you once again to, uh, in particular, to Bridget and Jose for joining us today. Uh, thank you to Heather for being a stalwart uh, during 2020 in making this happen. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, and I hope you have a good end of year and a better 2021. Thank you. <laughs>